Well, thank you. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Mark Sorono and the Global Fertil Fertility Academy for their invitation. Um, we'll review topics related to genetic testing in ART. These were the most important papers that were presented in ESHRA this year. Um, I want to point out that if there are any questions during my presentation, if there are some concepts that are not very um, well understood, please let me know so we can explain in more detail. So uh, the talk is going to be divided into two sections. The first section is in regards to next generation sequencing, which is basically a new way to study embryos. With next generation sequencing, we have the ability to sequence the genes um, from embryos, and we obtain a lot more information with the, than with the platforms used in the past. Specifically, we will review two papers. One is uh, related to the status, the euploidy status of embryos, whether they are biopsied and studied on day five versus day six of embryo development. And the second study is related to the clinical applications of uh, PGD um, with the objective of analyzing both single gene defects and the ploidy status of the embryos, which in the past were performed separately. Then we will review uh, three studies related to improvement in outcomes and embryo selection with genetic testing. The first study is a meta-analysis um, of randomized controlled trials to evaluate whether PGD, whether screening for the ploidy of embryos really helps us improve our clinical pregnancy rates. The second study is in regards to comparing in patients who have translocations, comparing the ability to achieve a pregnancy um, either after PGD versus patients that decide to conceive naturally. And the third paper is related to uh, the, the PGD results in IVF cycles after the transfer of frozen embryos. So beginning with the first section of our talk, the first um, paper was a poster presentation by um, a group in Poland entitled The Frequency of Aneuploidy Status of Day 5 and Day 6 Blastocysts Assessed by Next Generation Sequencing Technology Application. So in terms of a little bit of background, you all know that the embryos with the greatest morphology will have a higher probability of being um, chromosomally normal than compared to um, embryos that expose a lower morph mor morphology. And we know that during IVF cycles, the development of embryos, the rate in which they develop is going to be different. Um, we can have fully expanded embryos on day five, and these embryos, if they are fully expanded, will meet criteria to undergo a biopsy. Um, if the embryo is not fully expanded, then the decision is made to allow the embryo to, to grow one additional day in the lab, allow it to grow until day six, and then if it's fully expanded, um, have it undergo a biopsy. So the authors um, decided to undertake this study to assess the correlation between day five and day six blastocyst morphology and the ploidy status of these embryos. So it's a retrospective single center study in which patients with a median age of 38 years were included from August 2013 to November 2014. A total of 61 PGD cases were analyzed. A total of 168 blastocysts were evaluated with next generation sequencing. Of these blastocysts, 104 embryos were biopsied on day five because again, they met um, morphological criteria to undergo a biopsy. And the remaining 64 embryos were kept one more day in culture and then biopsied on day six. So the table clearly demonstrates, as you can see, the um, euploidy rate of embryos that are biopsied on day five is 47% versus the euploidy rate of embryos biopsied on day six, which is 28%. And this difference is statistically significant. In other words, if an embryo is biopsied on day five, the chances of finding an, a normal embryo is significantly higher than, it, it, than if it undergoes a biopsy on day six. Um, the authors then decided to evaluate the percentage of more high morphologically embryos, morphologically good quality embryos on day five and day six, and they found that really the, the rates of high quality embryos in both groups were similar being this 80% in the uh, day five biopsy and 71% in the day six biopsy. Then the, uh, the authors decided 
to analyze the pleurity status of these embryos that were biopsied on day five related to the morphology of, of themselves. So um, in the first group in which high quality embryos were included, you can see that the u pleurity rate was somewhat similar than compared to the embryos who exposed a less morphological score. The same thing was encountered in day six embryos that underwent biopsy. The u pleurity status was similar regardless of the morphology of these embryos. So no significant difference in blastocyst morphology was observed between day five and day six blastocysts. And the u pleurity and pleurity rates did not vary significantly between good and poor morphology embryos in either day five or day six. So this graph um, clearly depicts the clinical pregnancy rates achieved um, after the transfer of these embryos. A total of 50 single frozen embryo transfers were performed. The blue graph represents those embryos that were transferred after being diagnosed as normal. You can see a total of 39 embryos were transferred, and these are embryos from day five biopsy, in which 18 embryos achieved um, a pregnancy, as opposed to the transfer of day six normal embryos, which were also transferred. We can see that only three pregnancies were achieved after 11 transfers. Um, so although the number is rather limited, I mean, the percentage in terms of clinical pregnancy is very notable. Um, and you may ask yourselves, why is there a difference in pregnancy rates if we're transferring normal embryos? Well, I'm assuming, and maybe we can discuss this later, that these embryos, even though they're euploid, however, because they have been slower in their development, they may have other abnormalities in their metabolism or in their mitochondrial status that will eventually um, impact in the ability they have to implant. So the authors conclude that slower developing blastocysts cryopreserved on day six um, will, have, will not have similar chromosomal status and provide a lower chance of achieving pregnancy. The clinical implications of this study is that euploid embryos tend to show faster progression to the most advanced expansion stages when compared with aneuploid embryos. Great, so this second paper was a poster presentation from an Italian group, um, and it's entitled First Clinical Applications of PGD for Beta Thalassemia Combined with PGS on Blastocyst from Fresh and Vitrified Oocytes Using Next Generation Sequencing. So again, um, I, I find this uh, study rather important because in the past, um, and when I'm talking about a couple years ago, um, when we had a couple with a single gene mutation, um, of course, if we decide to biopsy the embryos of these couples, we might as well evaluate this, the pleurity status of, the, of these embryos. So in order to evaluate both the single gene mutation and the pleurity status, two separate tests had to be performed. Now with next generation sequencing, um, it's possible to study both things with the same technique. Um, so the aim of the study is to use next generation sequencing for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis of beta thalassemia combined with pre-implantation genetic screening. Um, additionally, the study um, is related as well to patients who have a low ovarian response. So these patients are a real challenge in our practice because not only will we automatically exclude 25% of these embryos since it's an autosomal recessive disorder, and we know that 25 of the embryos will be affected. Um, so aside from eliminating a quarter of our embryos, um, if we decide to study the pleurity status of these embryos as well, well, we may end up with no embryos for transfer. So uh, this study included seven infertile couples who had low ovarian response. These seven couples underwent two controlled ovarian hyperstimulation um, cycles. The oocytes from the first cycle were retrieved and were vitrified. And after the second controlled ovarian stimulation cycle, the oocytes were retrieved, were injected. The frozen or vitrified oocytes from the first cycle were also thawed, and they were also injected with the partner sperm. Um, and this will, of course, to increase the number of available oocytes and embryos to work with. Um, the embryos then were placed in a time lapse, and they were evaluated up to day five. And on day five, they were biopsied, and then they were vitrified again. So the biopsy was performed on day five or day six of the trifectoderm cells. 
Um, and after whole genome amplification, um, next generation sequencing was, was performed for the analysis of both the beta thalassemia and the pleurity status. So a total of 39 blastocysts were biopsied. Of these, 25 blastocysts came from fresh oocytes, and 14 blastocysts came from vitrified warmed oocytes. So you can see here, after the initial analysis, there were 37 results um, obtained. And as expected, nine of the 37 results um, reported an affected embryo. 16 embryos were reported to be carriers, and 12 embryos were free of the beta globin mutation. Additionally, um, the pleurity status of these embryos was analyzed, and a total of 22 embryos were found to be aneuploid, 15 were euploid. And this leaves us with a final uh, genetic diagnosis of 10 euploid embryos with less than um, less than equal to one beta globin mutation, which were um, feasible for transfer. So a total of seven transfers were, perform, were performed. Each one of these seven patients underwent a transfer, fortunately, and four clinical pregnancies were achieved. And the confirmation of the fetus being um, disease-free was confirmed with prenatal diagnosis. Uh, two of these pregnancies came from fresh oocytes, and two came from vitrified warmed oocytes. So in conclusions, after the study, well, using next-generation sequencing technology, it is possible to diagnose aneuploidies and single-gene defects, such as the one defect studied here. The use of fresh oocytes together with vitrified oocytes increases the number of available embryos to transfer. The clinical implications with these results is that in cases of limited ovarian response, it's possible to combine both fresh and vitrified warmed oocytes to increase the chances of, uh, of finding a normal euploid embryo to transfer. This option allows the couple to limit the cost of genetic analysis and increase the number of available embryos to transfer. So the second portion of our talk, which um, we're going to go over a bit of more clinical aspects and outcomes after pre-implantation genetic screening. The first uh, presentation is a presentation, a neural presentation that was performed by Dr. Dadu from Montreal, Canada, in conjunction with uh, the group of EV Spain. And it's a meta-analysis entitled Pre-implantation genetic screening using comprehensive chromosome screening technology improves embryo selection. And this is a meta-analysis of randomized control trials. So a little bit of background, and perhaps you all may know that most randomized control trials that have examined the impact of pre-implantation genetic screening using FISH have demonstrated no increase in live birth rates. And this is very important. FISH was a technology used in the past to evaluate the pleurity status of embryos. Um, now, most of the centers that under, uh, undertake or, or um, offer PGD to their patients or PGS to their patients do not use FISH as a technique. FISH has, been, has many drawbacks. One of um, them is that the number of chromosomes that, that can be analyzed is rather limited um, to a maximum of, of 11 to 12 chromosomes. Other drawbacks have to do with the techniques. Um, there's loss of hybridization, um, signal overlapping, and many other factors that will eventually give us um, inaccurate results. So comprehensive chromosome screening with various sorts of platforms which um, implies the analysis of all chromosomes that form the embryo can now be extensively tested and validated in PGS cycles. However, uh, whether PGS with CCS, which is comprehensive chromosome screening, improves embryo selection in IVF um, cycles remains still unclear. So the aim of this study is to determine whether the use of PGS CCS technology improves embryo selection in IVF cycles. So this was a meta-analysis of randomized control trials published before January 2015. Um, randomized control trials were eligible only if they compared PGS-CCS cycles to another method of embryo selection. Outcomes were clinical implantation rates and sustained implantation rates defined by the authors as the probability that an embryo would implant and progress beyond 20 weeks gestation. So a total of 750 articles were identified, and only three random control trials met full criteria. 
All, all others, um, all the other articles and studies were, were excluded from analysis. So a total of 276 embryos that underwent PGS, CCS, were um, included in the study and compared to a total of 383 embryos that were worked as controls. So the three studies that were included was a study from Yang et al. in 2012 um, in which RACGH was performed um, as the platform. Uh, Foreman and Scott from the same group in 2013, they used real-time PCR for the, for the analysis of the ploidy status of the embryos. And the important thing to, um, to establish, to note here in this graph, this forest plot, is that there was a significant difference, a highly significant increase in the probability of um, implanting an embryo after PGS versus um, the selection of embryos based on morphology alone. When analyzing the sustained implantation rate, and that is the ability the embryo has of implanting and continuing a pregnancy up until 20 weeks, was also significantly higher in the PGS-CCS embryos as opposed to the embryos that were selected based on morphology alone. So the conclusions to the study is that in patients with normal ovarian reserve, PGS-CCS improves embryo selection compared to the use of morphology alone. PGS-CCS is associated with significantly higher clinical implantation rates and sustained implantation rates. The authors also mention that, however, PGS-CCS is invasive and carries financial burdens. So this point, well, we will perhaps discuss this a little bit um, further in the discussion section, but with the new studies that have been published in these past years, when you perform a day five or day six biopsy, um, it's been demonstrated that there is no decrease in implantation rates as opposed to what was performed a few years back when the embryo was biopsied on day three. So the clinical implications to the study is that PGS-CCS improves embryo selection compared to the use of embryo morphology alone. PGS-CCS might be helpful when used in the setting of an elective single embryo transfer practice. So the second poster in this section is entitled Comparison of the Life Birth Rate Between PGD and Natural Conception in Patients with Recurrent Pregnancy Loss Associated with Translocation. This paper was done in a center in Japan. And you all know that um, an important cause of recurrent pregnancy loss uh, is parental chromosomal abnormalities. And one of these parental chromosomal, chromosomal abnormalities that clearly is associated with a higher risk of aneuploidy in embryos or translocations. So PGD in these patients can be used to prevent miscarriage rates. To date, however, there has been no cohort study conducted to compare the life birth rates in patients matched for age, a number of previous miscarriages, undergoing PGD versus conceiving naturally. So the aim of the study is to determine whether PGD really improves the, the life birth rate compared to natural conception in patients who are carrier, carriers for translocations. So this is a cohort study that was conducted between August 2003 and November 2013. The subsequent pregnancies were followed up until July 2014. So this, is, this was a very, very long study, and it's something that we have to take in, in, into account. I mean, in 10 years, the technology can definitely evolve and has improved, and we've been, witnessed, we've been witnesses of that. Um, but we'll discuss this uh, again in the discussion section if you have any questions in regards to this. So a total of 126 Japanese patients with recurrent pregnancy loss associated with translocations were included. After genetic counseling, 52 patients decided to attempt natural conceptions, and 74 patients opted to undergo PGD. The life birth rate, the cumulative life birth rate, and miscarriage rates were compared between only 37 patients undergoing PGD who were age-matched uh, with the 52 patients who decided to conceive naturally and did not undergo PGD. So PGD in this study was performed by FISH analysis, which is the ideal platform for the study of translocations, on blastomeres obtained from day three embryos at about eight cell stage. So these were embryos were biopsied on day three and the FISH technique was used to evaluate or determine the breakage point of these chromosomes. So 
In the table, you can find, um, you can see that the live birth rate after the first trial of PGD was only 37% compared to the first trial of natural conception, which, is, which was 53.8%. However, despite this difference, the difference was not statistically significant. You can see that the cum cumulative life birth rate was 67% versus 65% in those patients that decided to conceive naturally. And there was a significant difference in the miscarriage rates in which patients undergoing PGD had nine miscarriages versus 30 miscarriages of patients who decided to conceive naturally. Again, this difference is statistically significant. And as expected, the, pregnancy, the twin pregnancy rate would be higher in patients undergoing PGD just because they get more um, embryos transferred back into the uterus. So no difference in birth rate was found between both groups, and the prevalence of twin pregnancy was significantly higher in the PGD group. So the conclusions made to the study is that while PGD significantly prevented further miscarriage, there was no difference in the life birth rate. Single embryo transfer should be selected to prevent a higher risk of multiple pregnancies and the risk of preterm delivery. Now, at this point, I'd like to mention as well that um, if you remember, carriers of translocations um, experience a significantly higher degree of aneuploid gametes. So aside from evaluating the, the breakage points of the chromosomes in these embryos, it should be suggested as well to these couples to evaluate the ploidy status of the remaining chromosomes. So this can be one of the, the drawbacks, one of the reasons why the life birth rates was not significantly higher in the patients who underwent PGD. Aside from the fact that FISH was also employed, and we mentioned earlier that FISH has um, uh, the, the deficiency of not having the ability to evaluate all chromosomes. So the clinical implications is that during genetic counseling, couples should be fully informed of the advantages and disadvantages of PGD and the advantages of natural pregnancy. So the last study is entitled Pre-Implantation Genetic Screening in IVF Cycles with Frozen Embryo Transfer. This is a two-year experience of one PGS center in Austria. Um, just a little bit of background. Um, in the past, in many centers, uh, when they offer PGD to their patients, many centers can offer, for example, a biopsy on day five, and with, for example, real-time PCR, it, there's a, the ability to obtain results within a four to six hour time lapse. So you have the ability to transfer the embryos the following day on day six. Um, in our center, we no longer do this. We decide to biopsy the embryo on day five, we vitrify the embryo, and then we transfer the embryo back um, in a subsequent cycle. So a lot of centers are beginning to do this same um, thing with the, the couples that are candidates for PDD. Um, so this study can help us better understand what the results are in terms of this. Um, so the benefit of com comprehensive chromosome screen screening is still controversially discussed. And clearly there are articles who have demonstrated a significant increase in pregnancy rates in patients that are young and patients, patients with a good prognosis. Um, a further benefit of PGS has also been encountered in patients who, are, who have advanced maternal age. So the aim of the study was to ascertain whether PGS improves pregnancy rates in IVF cycles with the transfer of vitrified, warm, frozen embryos, and whether PGS results and clinical outcomes differ in relation to advanced maternal age. So a total of, um, well, the, the, the patients included in the study were patients obtained from, two year, from a two-year period from 2013 to 2014. And the clinical outcomes, that is pregnancy rate per frozen embryo transfer, was compared with age-matched outcomes of frozen embryo transfers without PGS. So the patients were divided into three groups. In group one were patients, um, young patients less than equal to 30 years of age. In group two were patients that were less than 38 or equal to 38 years of age. And in group three, patients above the age of 38 were, were included. These patients were then subdivided according to whether PGS was performed. In group A, were the transfers performed after PGS. In group B, were transfers performed without PGS. So in the first group, um, these were eggs obtained from donor cycles. A total of 192 blastocysts were biopsied. 
and 24 frozen embryo transfers were performed and compared to patients in the same age category who underwent a frozen embryo transfer without PGS. In the second group, a total of 162 blastocysts were biopsied and 19 frozen embryo transfers were performed and compared to 200 frozen embryo transfers without PGS. In group three, 261 blastocysts were biopsied, 28 frozen embryo transfers performed, and compared to 95 frozen embryo transfers without PGS. Uh, PGS analysis was performed on trophectoderm cells by RACGH. So this graph clearly demonstrates the increase in aneuploidy rates of embryos according to the different age groups. Notice how close to 50% of embryos that were analyzed on day five were abnormal in group one, close to 60% were abnormal in group two, and close to 75% were abnormal in group three. So this, these results are comparable to other studies that have actually looked into this, the pluridity status of embryos according to the age of the patients. And our patients get always um, find, this, find themselves surprised when we show them these, these results. Again, these were embryos that made it to day five. We're not taking into account all the oocytes obtained from these patients. So the proportion of aneuploid embryos, including both whole chromosomal and segmental unbalanced changes, increases with advanced maternal age. And this increase is statistically significant. So when we look at pregnancies um, achieved, the green bar demonstrates the transfers after PGS was performed in these patients. And notice how the pregnancy rates throughout the different age groups is sort, sort of maintained the same. So once you transfer an embryo back into the uterus of a patient, regardless of the age of the patient, if it's normal, if the embryo is a normal embryo, the chances of pregnancy are not going to be different than their younger, um, than their younger counterparts. Um, however, notice in the first group, the difference between transferring a a screened embryo versus transferring an embryo which was not diagnosed is somewhat similar. There was no statistical um, significant difference between these two groups. Uh, however, it, when the patient is above the age of 38, notice how the clinical pregnancy rate clearly is higher after the transfer of uh, healthy embryos. In this um, age category patients, although the P is not significant, there is a, there's a trend and difference in terms of the clinical pregnancy rates obtained on, on patients that received an embryo who had been screened. So the pregnancy rates per frozen embryo transfer did not significantly differ among PGS groups. The overall pregnancy rate per frozen embryo transfer after PGS was significantly improved in comparison with frozen embryo transfers without PGS. So the conclusions of this study is that a statistically significant overall increase in pregnancy rates after PGS with frozen embryo transfer was observed when compared with patients not undergoing PGS with frozen embryo transfer. The higher increase in pregnancy rates was seen predominantly in the older age category patients. So PGS can overcome the adverse effect of uh, advanced maternal age. Although the proportion of aneuploid embryos strongly increased with advanced maternal age, pregnancy rates did not significantly differ from younger patients when PGS was applied. So the clinical implications with this, these results is that PGS is a useful method for choosing viable embryos for frozen embryo transfer, particularly in patients with advanced maternal age. So in summary, um, in, the first, in the first study that was reviewed, we know that euploid embryos uh, tend to show faster progression to the most advanced expansion stages when compared with aneuploid embryos. Chama Yu, the Italian group, um, they conclude that in cases of limited ovarian response, it's possible to combine the diagnosis of embryos obtained from fresh and vitrified warmed oocytes. This option allows a couple to have a better chance of not only having a transfer, but also achieving a pregnancy. Um, the meta-analysis by Dadu uh, demonstrates that PGS with CCS improves embryo selection compared to the use of embryo morphology alone. Uh, 
And the Japanese group concludes that while PDD significantly prevented further miscarriages, there was no difference in the life birth rate of patients with um, translocations. Uh, Ruba concludes that a statistically significant overall increase in pregnancy rates after PGS with frozen embryo transfer was observed when compared with patients not undergoing PGS. Well, with that, um, I'll finish my presentation and open for any questions. Thank you. <laughs>